Topic for today is hashing. We have come across many data structures so far. And now we'll look at another data structure. So we have seen arrays, we have seen linked lists. In this video, we will be discussing a data structure known as table. So the data structure that I want to talk about is a table data structure. Okay. So what is this table data structure? Let's try to give you a background on why we want to discuss this new data structure. See, the table data structure plays a significant role in information retrieval. Let's take an example. Suppose you have n distinct records. Okay, let's say you have records. Let's say you have n distinct records. n. So you have 1, 2, 3 and so on till n. So this is your first record, your second, your third and so on. This is your nth record. So every record is identified by a key value. So for record 1, I have a key k1. I have a key k2 for record 2, k3 for record 3 and similarly kn for record n. So I have n distinct records where every record is identified uniquely by a key value given by k1, k2, k3 till kn. And suppose we have stored these records in a file. Now we want to find a record with a given key value, let's say k. We are looking for a record with a key value k. So one approach that you could think of in order to find a record with a key value k is to apply linear search. So what you will do is in sequential search, you will start from the location of the first record. You will compare the item of search with the given key value in the record. If it matches, you will report that the search is successful. If it does not, you will move on to the next record. Again, you will do the checking. You will check with the key value and that means you will check with the search item and you will check it with the key value of the record. You will do the same for the third record and so on till the time you find a successful match or you have exhausted all the records present in your table. And then you can report that the search is uns unsuccessful. So one thing you can understand is that your search time is directly proportional to the number of records present in your table. That means the time taken to search a table or let's say time taken to search a file having 10 records is a lot lesser than the time taken to search a file containing 10,000 records. So greater the number of records, greater will be your search time. However, this search time can be made independent of the number of records if we apply a different approach. What we can do is we can significantly reduce the search time or even make it independent of the number of records if we use a table known as access table. An access table will give us the liberty to search for a record with a key value k and the search time will be independent of the number of records present in the file. Now this table, this access table which I am talking about this table may store the location of all records in the file. I'll show you how. Let me show you this with the help of a diagram. Have a look at this figure which I have drawn for you. You have an access table and you have a file storage which contains all the records and I have shown only the key values because every record will be uniquely identified by its key value. Now, what happens is in the figure, what you see is the use of an access table to retrieve any record in the file storage. Here we assume a function f. Here we assume a function f and if this function is applied on k. So to the function f you give your search item value. Your search item is also identified by a key value. You give the key item value to your function and the function will produce the output as an index into the access table. Now using that index you can 
directly go to your file storage and retrieve the record. This method of accessing any record is called table lookup which is independent of the number of records in the file. So I hope you understood this point. Just to be doubly sure, I'll illustrate the mechanism of access table in another way. See, let's say you want to search for a record having a key value of let's say K3. Now in sequential search, what would you do? You would take this key value and you would match it with every record. Now, whenever you find a successful match, you can report that the search is successful and you can also report the entire record along with the message of the search being successful. Now, what can happen is you may end up searching the entire file and may not find the record at all. That can also be possible. Why? Because it can happen that the record is not present in the file. So in that case, you will report that the search is unsuccessful. So the number of records which are present in your file will determine the search time. So greater the number of records, greater will be the search time. Now an alternative approach could be the use of an access table. An access table will help you to make the search time independent of the number of records in the file. That means whether you have 10 records or 10,000 records, the search time will be the same. So what you do is you devise a function. This function we are calling it f and to this function f you plug in the key value. So you plug in the key value k3 to the function. So you give the function k3. What will the function produce? The function will produce an output which will be the index in the access table. So to the function f I will give the key value k3 and what will I get? Let's say I get the output as i3. Now using this i3, I will go to my access table. So I'll go to my access table. Let's say somewhere here, I go to the access table and whatever I find that is the location. Whatever I find as the content of i3 is the location of the record with key value k3. So using that value in location i3, I will go to my file storage and access my record. So you can understand that the key value index is being calculated from the key value itself. As a result, the search time now becomes independent of the number of records. So this is how access tables will help to reduce the search time from big O of n to big O of 1. To big O of 1. So a classic example of constant time complexity is the use of access table. If we use linear search, we have a worst case complexity of order of n. But if we use an access table where the location of a record is dependent on the key value, then the worst case time complexity becomes order of 1. So hashing is an example of constant time complexity. So I hope this part is understood. Next, we'll move on to what is a hash table. There are many table data structures available. You can have a rectangular table, a jagged table, an inverted table, as well as a hash table. Out of these four tables, the one which is most popularly used is the hash table. And in this video, we'll restrict our discussion to hash tables only. Let's try to understand what a hash table exactly is. So a hash table, remember, a hash table, I'll write down a few points. A hash table is nothing but an array. It is an array of constant size. It is an array of constant size. Now, the size of the hash table, the size of the hash table will depend on, the size of the hash table depends on the application. It depends on the application you are using. The application in which the hash table is going to be employed will determine the size of the hash table. And also remember that the hash table will contain key values with pointers to the corresponding records. Like you saw in case of an access table, this access table is nothing but your hash table. This is how a hash table looks like. This is what an, a hash table looks like where you will have key values with pointers to the corresponding records. These are your key values. 
these are your key values and what you get are pointers to the corresponding record see every key value slot every key value slot will contain pointers to the records on your file so that's what a hash table is and remember the location the location of the record in the file storage will be calculated from the key value itself so this this is a one to one correspondence i hope you can understand that there is a one to one correspondence between a key value and an index in the hash table right when you plug in the key value to a function you get the index value so there is a one to one mapping between a key value and an index in the hash table this mapping this mapping is known as hashing this mapping or this one to one correspondence between a key value and an index in the hash table is known as hashing so i'll just write it down for you so what i'm saying is this there is a one to one mapping there is a one to one there is a one to one mapping between between there is a one to one mapping between a key value between a key value and an index and an index in the hash table there is a one to one mapping between a key value and an index in the hash table in the I'll just lift it up a bit and show it to you there's a one to one mapping between a key value and an index in the hash table and this one to one mapping is known as hashing this is what you call hashing okay this is known as hashing this one to one mapping why why am i saying that's one to one mapping see there is a one to one mapping because every key value every key value will be mapped to only one location in the hash table that means for a particular key value k3 you will get only one index value i3 in the hash table it will not happen that one key value maps to multiple locations in the hash table that will never happen that's why we are saying that there is a one to one mapping so this one to one mapping between a key value and an index in the hash table is known as hashing or it is also known as address calculation indexing it is also known as address calculation indexing it is also known as address calculation indexing okay just keep these points in mind now next what we'll do is we'll move on to the concept of hashing okay the main idea behind hashing like i told you was to find this one to one correspondence between a key value and an index in the hash table where the key value can be placed now how do you do this you represent this using a function and this function is known as a hash function this concept of mapping one key value to one index in the hash table can be represented using a function mathematically so mathematically it can be expressed using a diagram now one thing you must understand is like i said there is a one to one correspondence so one key value one key value will map to one index but it can happen that multiple key values are mapping to the same index please keep this in mind one key value will map to only one index that means k3 will be mapped only to i3 it will not happen that k3 is mapped to i3 as well as i6 as well as i7 that will never happen k3 will always map to only one index that is i3 but it can happen that along with k3 you have k13 k13 is also mapping to i3 that can happen so multiple key values can map to the same index location and such a mapping is known as if you remember from your math classes such a mapping is known as surjective mapping this is known as surjective mapping so how can i represent this mathematically if you look at the set of keys so if this is your set of keys and if you have a set of indices okay let's say you have keys let's say just drawing a few random key values and you have a few keys let's say you have four keys now what happens is see there'll be only one key so one key will go to only one location but it can happen that multiple keys are going to the same location 
So this key is going to this location and this key is also going to this location. Let's say this key is going to this location and just for completion's sake, this key is going to this location. So this kind of mapping where you have multiple key values going to the same location and also there is the possibility of one key value going to exact going to one location. That means one location is accommodating only one key value. This is known as surjective mapping. This is known as surjective mapping. So our objective is to find a function. Our objective is to find a function f such that the key values will be mapped to index values. Our objective is to function is to find this function f which will map the key values to the corresponding index values. Okay. Now here i as you can see in the diagram i denotes the range of indices. Your f denotes the function f denotes the hash function at times instead of writing in many books what you will see is instead of writing f they also write h. So you can have this notation as well. This is also perfectly all right. So even here the function is denoted by capital H. Here the function is denoted by small f. Okay, fine. Now the hash function plays a dominant role in hashing techniques. You can understand, right? It's the function which determines everything. So the hash function will play a major role in the hashing technique. Now in devising a function, in devising a function, we must keep two rules in mind. See the function that governs this mapping, this mapping that you see from key values to index values, the function that governs this mapping is called the hash function. And there are two principal criteria in deciding the hash function. We must keep two things in mind. So I'll just write it down while dictating the points. So the first thing that we must keep in mind is that the function h, the function h should be, the function h should be very easy it should be very sorry about that it should be very easy and quick it should be very easy and quick to compute so you have to choose your function you have to devise your hash function in such a way that it's very easy and quick to compute and the second thing the second criteria that it has to satisfy is that it should give the hash function should give as far as possible it should give as far as possible two different it should give as far as possible two different indices it should give as far as possible two different indices for two different key values as far as possible okay you will never have let me just complete this off for two different indices so you will never have you'll never have a perfect hash function which will map one key value to one index to one location or to one index and that index will be used for this one key value only that will never happen it, it can happen that multiple key values are mapping to the same index that, that is very much possible. But our objective would be to minimize this possibility as far as possible. Our objective is to minimize the possibility of having multiple key values mapping to the same index. So we should choose our hash function in such a way that this possibility of mapping multiple key values to the same index is minimized. And this phenomenon of having multiple key values mapping to the same index will take it up shortly. It is known as collision. It is known as collision. Okay, So the allotment of more than one key value to the same index in the hash table is known as collision. And our objective will be to minimize collision as far as possible. And choosing the hash function appropriately goes a long way in minimizing collision. Now next what we'll do is we will take up a few hash functions and I'll explain them with the help of examples. Pause the video and go through the example which I have written. So I hope you have gone through this example. I just summarized things for you. We have been given a hash table of size 10. The indices range from 0 to 9. The lowest index in the hash table is 0 and the highest index is 9. These are my key values that you can see and we have been given a hash function denoted by h and the hash function is given in 
word form. Remember, the hash function can either be given to you mathematically using a formula or it can be given in statement form like you can see here. Here the hash function is given in statement form and what is it saying? That the hash function proceeds in two steps. What is the first step? The first step is telling us to add the two digits in the key. We can see that all our key values are two digit values. So we have to add the two digits in the key and we have to take the digit at the unit place as index into our hash table and if there is a digit at the 10th place we'll have to ignore it. So what we'll do is we will come up with the mapping. So I'll show you two things right. I'll show you the mapping. So the mapping will mainly consist of your key value and your index value. So how many key values do we have? We have 10 key values. So let me write down every key value for you. What you see here are the key values that have been given to us. So I've written the key values. Now I have to find the indices. I have to find the indices using the hash function which has been given in statement form. So what is the first thing that we have to do? So I'll write down the key values for all these keys. So the first step is to add the two digits. So if I add 1 and 0, what do I get? I get 1. Now it's a single digit result. So 1 will be the index. Similarly, if I add 1 and 9, what do I get? I get 10. So in now I have 10, right? Now 10 here consists of two digits. I'll ignore the digit at the 10th place. So in my 1 plus 9, I'm getting 10. I'm getting 10. So I'll be ignoring this 1 and I'll be taking the 0. So the index is 0. Similarly, what is 3 plus 5? 3 plus 5 is 8. So index is 8. Similarly, 4 plus 3 is 7. So the index is 7. 6 plus 2 is 8. Now, as you can see that two keys, see, 35 as well as 62, they're mapping to the same index. This is very much possible in case of hashing, where multiple key values are mapping to the same index, but you will never find that one key value is mapping to multiple indices. You can have multiple indices or you can have the same index accommodating multiple key values. You can have same index accommodating multiple key values, but it will never happen that you will have multiple key values or you will have the same key value rather mapping to multiple locations. The same key value will never map to multiple locations, but the same index location can accommodate or let's say can be mapped to or can be mapped by multiple key values. The same index location can be mapped by multiple key values. Now what is 5 plus 9? 5 plus 9 is 14. So I'll ignore the 1 and I'll take 4. I'll take the units place, right? See 5 plus 9 is 14. I'll ignore this 1 and I'll take 4. So similarly, if I fill up the remaining entries, what do I get? So if I fill up the remaining entries, this is what I get. I can see that multiple key values are mapping to the same index like you can have like you can see here and you can see here as well 35 and 62 are mapping to the same index of 8 59 and 31 are mapping to the same index of 4 as well as 77 is also mapping to 4 so this can happen right now this situation our objective would be to minimize the mapping to same index location and one way to do that is by choosing the hash function wisely Okay, and this, this phenomenon of, of having multiple key values mapped to the same location is known as collision. Now, even, even if you devise a very sophisticated hash function, you will never be able to eliminate collision completely. So, even if collision takes place, we can have ways out of it. And those are known as collision resolution techniques. We'll see collision resolution techniques shortly. Okay. So this is what the mapping looks like and how would the hash table look like? I'll show you. Here you see the hash table of size 10 where the lowest index is 0 and the highest index is 9. So what we'll do is we'll place these key values in the corresponding locations of the hash table. So what would my, what would my hash table look like? As you can see, I have written down all the key values in the corresponding indices. So using my mapping, I have filled up my hash table. 
obviously don't think that because I've written th three values here, the hash table can accommodate more than one value in one location. No, that will never happen. The hash table will accommodate only one value in one location. Here three values are shown just to indicate that they are mapped to the same location. And if you have such multiple values in the same location, it is a case of collision. Okay, so this is how you can use the statements or the hash function to build your hash table. Now what I'll show you is a few popularly used hash functions. This one was given in statement form. This was a, you know, a made up hash function. Now I'll show you some popularly used hash functions. Okay, the first popularly used hash function is the division method. It is fast and it is very popularly used. Here, a few terminologies have to be kept in mind. The first one is the number of keys is denoted by capital N. The set of key values is denoted by capital K and any particular key value is denoted by small k. Also, we have a term known as small h, which is usually a prime number or a number without small divisors because this ends up reducing the number of collisions. And generally, h is equal to the size of the hash table. And the hash function that we can see here, the division method, the division method, the hash function for the division method is defined as you can see here. So in order to find the index of a particular key value, small k, we can apply either this formula of k mod h where mod, where the mod operator will give us the remainder. The mod operator will give us the remainder value. It will give us the remainder of dividing k by h. On dividing k by h, the remainder that we get will be given by mod. So if the ind indices or if the index of the hash table starts from 0, then we would use this formula of division method. If the index of the hash table starts from 1, then we would use the formula k mod h plus 1 for our division method function. Okay, And mod, like I mentioned, gives us the remainder value. So an example could be, let's say, your key value. Let's say the key value given to us is 37. The key value is 37. And let's say the size of the hash table. Let's say the size of the hash table is 13. Let's say the size of the hash table is 13. And indexing starts from 0. If indexing starts from 0, what will we get? We will get 37, 37 mod 13, right? We'll get 37 mod 13. Because what did I say? If indices start from 0, we use simply k mod h. So what is 37 mod 3? I mean 37 mod 13. What is 37 mod 13? If you divide 37 by 13, what is the remainder that you get? The remainder that you get is 11. So 11 is the index location at which your key value 37 has to be mapped in the hash table. And if you were to use this formula, that means if the hash table, if the starting index of the hash table is from 1, then we have to use this formula. That is 37 mod 13 plus 1. So 37 mod 13 has already given us 11. A plus 1 will give us a value of 12. So in that case, we would map 37 to the index of 12 in the hash table. So this is how the division method works for hashing. Next, we'll look up mid-square method. Let's have a look at mid-square method. In mid-square method, what we'll do is we will take the key value, we'll square it, and then we will select an appropriate number of digits from the squared value, which will usually depend on the size of the hash table. Now, to illustrate this point, let me take up an example. Let's say we require three-digit addresses. And our selection criteria is to select three digits at even positions starting from the rightmost digit in the square. Let us see the address calculations for three distinct keys and with the hash functions as defined here. 
here you can see there are key values and their squares so i'll start with the first one the key value given to us is one two three four what do we require we require three digit addresses our hash table is defined in such a way that we require three digit addresses we require three digit addresses for our hash table right now what will we do we will take the key value we will square it and now the mid square method that i'm about to define is such that we will select we will select starting from the right right we are going to go from right to left we are going to go from since it is applicable for all the keys i have shown it for all three okay so we are going from right to left so if i go from right to left what i can see is i have these i have this order so going from right to left i'll select digits at even position so this is one two this is the second position this is an even position so i'll select this digit then three four this is an even position so i'll select the digit five six this is an even position so i'll select the digit so what does my key location come out to be it comes out to be five two five so this is the index value that i get from my hash function which i defined for you the hash function i'll just repeat once again the selection criteria is to select three digits at even positions starting from the rightmost digit of the square so i'll do the same thing here again i'll take the even positions from right to left so which is the first even position one two this is an even position i'll take this then three four even position i'll take this five six even position i'll take this so what does the index come out to be four nine two similarly here if you observe we have one two three four five six right now you may be wondering what about seven eight i will not take this anymore why because i already have the three digit address i already have the three digit address which is nine three three anything beyond this will be ignored so this is what will be this is what you get as the index location in the hash table for these key values so this was mid square method next i'll show you folding method the next popularly used hash function is folding now folding involves the first step which is known as chopping now in chopping what you do is you will take your key you will take the key value and you will partition it into a number of parts where each part will have the same number of digits or the same number of bits as the required address width that means if you are considering your address width or if the address width of your hash table is of two digits then you will have to partition the key in terms of two digits if the address width or if the address value of every location in the hash table is of three digits then you have to partition the keys in terms of three digits now while partitioning it may happen that the last part or let's say after partitioning starting from right to left the last portion that is remaining that is not of the same number of digits but that's fine partition will happen in such a way that every part has the same number of digits except possibly the last and step two would be done in such a way where you get three types of folding functions so what you do is if you take after chopping if you simply add up the parts that you have got and if you ignore the carry to obtain the final address that is known as pure folding if you take the parts and you reverse the even parts before addition with the remaining parts that would be known as fold shifting and if you simply reverse the boundary parts before it adding it to the remaining parts it would be known as fold boundary so with this theoretical knowledge in mind what i'll do is i'll take up an example so that you will be able to understand this concept even better let's try to understand folding with the help of an example so i'll show you an example here now here we have been given three key values and i want to illustrate the three types of folding methods what are the three types pure folding fold shifting and fold boundary i want to illustrate these three folding techniques on these key values remember all the three techniques of pure folding fold shifting and fold boundary will involve the initial step of chopping where you will divide your key from right to left 
into equal number of parts except possibly the last part and each part will have the same number of digits as the required address width. Now here I'm assuming that the address width of my hash table, the address width, the address width of my hash table of hash table is two digits. So that's the assumption I'm making that the address width of my hash table is two digits. So what will I do from right to left? I'll be chopping in terms of two digits. Now let's start. So I'll start with this key value. Okay. So I'll chop it into two parts. So I'll get 56. So after chopping the first part that I get is 56. I'm going from right to left. Okay. I'm going in this direction from right to left. So that's the first part that I get 56. The next part I get is 27. That is the next key. And then I get 52. So my third key is 52. Okay, I'm running out of space a bit. And the fourth part that I get is 1. So I'll leave it as 1. No problem. See, what did I say? You will chop it into equal bits. You will chop it. You will partition the key. If you remember, what did I say? I said that partition the key into a number of parts where each part, except possibly the last, has the same number of digits as the required address width. So what is your address width? Your address width is 2 digits. So you started chopping in terms of 2 digits. But it so happened that the last part that was left is of one digit. No problem. Let it be. Let it be that way. Now, I'll apply pure folding on this. What are my parts? My part, one part is the value 1. Another is 52. Another is 27. And another is 56. In pure folding, what will I do? I'll simply add up these parts. So, I'll say 1 plus 52 plus 27 plus 56. I'll simply add up these parts. Now, if I add them up, what will I get? If you add them up, you will end up, I think you will get end up getting 136. Now, what is the address width? The address width is two digits. So, you will ignore this one. You will ignore this one and you will take only 36. You will take only 36. So, 36 is the index value for this entire key 15222756. Okay. Now, what would happen in fold shifting? In fold shifting, the chopping part is common, right? You have chopped it and obtained these keys. Now in fold shifting, what you will do is you will reverse the even parts. So again, you will scan from right to left. So this is the first part. So this is odd. This is part one. One is odd. This is part two. So I'll, so 56 remains unchanged. The next one is 27. 27 is part two and two is an even number. So what will I do? I will reverse it. So 27 is reversed to 72. Then the next part is 52. So this is part 3. Now 3 is an odd number. So I'll keep it unchanged. So I'll keep it to 52. I'll keep it to 52. Now what is the fourth part? The fourth part is even and the fourth part is 1. Now writing 1, see, writing 1 is same as it's equivalent to 0, 1. See, I want every part to be of 2 digits. So just for consistency, Instead of writing 1, I can write 0, 1. Now, if I write 0, 1 and if I reverse this, what will I get? I'll get 1, 0. So, 1 will be reversed as 1, 0. Right? So, 0, 1 is reversed as 1, 0. Now, I'll add them up. So, if I add them up, what will I get? If I add them up, I think I'll get 190. I'll get 190. Now, what is my address width? My address width is 2 digits. So, I'll ignore. I'll ignore this part. And I'll take only 90. So, the index value is 90. And what will I do in fold boundary? In fold boundary, I will simply reverse the extreme two parts. So what are the extreme two parts? The rightmost part is 56. So I'll reverse it and I'll get 65. And the leftmost part is 0, 1. I'll reverse it and I'll get 1, 0. The remaining parts remain unchanged. So 52 will remain as it is and so will 27. Now, if I add up 10, 52, 27 and 65, so I'm adding up, right? If I add up, then I get 154. Again, my address width is of two digits. So I'll ignore this one and I'll get 54 as the final result. I'll get 54 as the final result. Okay. So this is how it works. This is how the folding methods work. Now we'll do the same with the remaining keys. So let's start. So chopping will give me 
25 it will so it will give me 25 it will give me 90 it will give me 90 it will give me 49 it will give me 49 and it will give me 05 right now in pure folding i'll simply add them up so i'll say 05 plus 49 plus 90 plus 25 and the sum comes out to be if you calculate you will get i think you will get 169 if i'm not mistaken you will get 169 now again since the address is of two digits i'll ignore this one and i'll get only 69 as the index of this key value using pure folding now in fold shifting what will i do again these are my parts the key parts the chopping part is common in fold shifting i'll reverse the even parts so this is my first even part so it's 90 90 will become 09 or only 9 and the next even part is 05 so 05 will become 50 and the remaining parts that is 49 and 25 they remain unchanged now if i add these up if i add these up what will i get if i add these up i'll get 133 now i'll ignore this one and i'll end up getting 33 as the index value for this key using fold shifting now in fold boundary what will i do again the extreme ends that means 25 and 5 they'll be reversed so i'll get 50 i mean i'll get 52 rather sorry if i reverse 25 i'll get 52 and if i reverse 05 i'll get 50 the remaining parts remain unchanged that is 49 and 90 they remain unchanged and if you add up 50 49 90 and 52 you end up getting sorry you end up getting 241 where you will ignore this 2 because the address width is of two digits so you will take the two digits from the right that is 41 so 41 is your index value right now what about this what about the third key in the third case again we'll chop we'll chop in terms of two digits so i'll get 36 i'll get 39 i'll get 94 and i'll get 11 right so now in pure folding i'll simply add them up in pure folding i'll add up 11 94 39 and 36 what will i get if i add them up i'll get 180 again i'll take only the two digits from the right and i'll ignore the one in the most significant digit position so i'll get 80 as my key value now in fold shifting what will i do i'll reverse the even parts so this is my first even part see this is one two three four so two will be reversed and four will be reversed now if i reverse 39 i get 93 36 remains unchanged 94 also remains unchanged i'll write it here 94 also remains unchanged and this 11 if i reverse it i get 11 itself now if i add these four up if i add these four up using fold shifting what will i get i'll get 234 and now if i ignore this two i'm left with 34 so the index is 34 and what about fold boundary in fold boundary i'll reverse the extreme positions so my parts were 36 39 94 and 11 the extreme positions that means 36 and 11 they'll be reversed so if i reverse them i'll get 63 11 is reversed to become 11 itself and the remaining parts remain unchanged now i'll add them up now if i add these four values if i add these four values i'll get 207 i'll get 207 so if i get 207 i can see that address width is of two digits so i'll ignore the two and i'm left with 07 that means only seven so the index of this key using fold boundary is seven so i hope you have understood the popularly used hash functions in the next video on hashing we will discuss collision and collision resolution techniques if you have any doubts please feel free to leave your comments in the section given below i'll see you in the next one